If you're enjoying Why This Universe, there's another University of Chicago Podcast Network show that you should check out, and it's called Capital Isn't. Capital Isn't uses the latest economic thinking to zero in on the ways that capitalism is and more often isn't working today. Join Vanity Fair contributing editor Bethany McLean and distinguished professor of economics Luigi Zingales as they explain how capitalism can go wrong and what we can do about it. Listen to Capital Isn't, part of the University of Chicago Podcast Network. Okay, so I've got right in front of me this coffee cup. I hit my mic and started. <laughs> I've got in front of me right now, Shalma, my coffee cup. It's sitting on my desk. And so long as like nothing comes into contact with it or otherwise interacts with it, this coffee cup is pretty much going to do absolutely nothing. If I sit here for another second or minute or hour or even 100 years, it's still just going to be a coffee cup. A cold coffee cup, but yeah. Yes. Um, it's cold now. I already finished the coffee in it. Oh, okay. So, <laughs> but yeah, if you, if you like put it down, got up, ran some errands, came back, it, you don't expect it to have like turned into water or something. That's right. This, this coffee cup on, at least on human time scales is just going to stay a coffee cup. Okay. So why on earth would anyone expect their coffee cup to do anything different? Things don't just randomly change into other things. That's not how it works, right? Well, if you got down to the level of particles, it turns out that sometimes they can transform. Not all particles do this, like electrons and photons will stay as they are forever, but other particles aren't so stable. In fact, lots of particles change identity through what we call decay. For example, a neutron, that thing found in atomic nuclei, can spontaneously decay into a proton and an electron. That's what we call beta decay. But decay isn't the only way particles can transform. And in today's episode of Why This Universe, we're going to talk about a kind of particle that transforms itself in a very unexpected way, all because of some quantum weirdness. That particle is the neutrino. And before we get started, just a reminder that Why This Universe is now on Patreon. So if you like our show and you want to support us and you want to hear more from us, you should definitely join our Patreon community. You'll get ad-free versions of all of our episodes, exclusive Ask Me Anything episodes in which you can both submit questions and listen to the answers for everyone else's questions. They're a lot of fun. And also exclusive interview clips and other extras that come up along the way. You also, of course, earn our unending appreciation. So if you're interested in supporting us on Patreon, go to patreon.com slash why this universe. You're listening to Why This Universe, a podcast where we break down the biggest ideas in physics. My name is Shalma, and I'm a PhD student at NYU. And I'm Dan Hooper. I'm a theoretical astrophysicist at Fermilab and at the University of Chicago. The neutrino is a particle that has surprised physicists again and again, and maybe its first surprise is that it even exists. After all, it's not a particle we can see in our atoms or in the molecules that make up the world around us. Instead, neutrinos pass through most matter completely unaffected. Like trillions of neutrinos produced by our sun are passing through your body right this second. That even sounds like science fiction. So why do these weird particles exist? Well, think back to the sort of decay that we mentioned in the beginning of the episode, beta decay. When physicists studied this decay, they realized that there was a problem. There seemed to be some energy missing after it happened. The starting neutron had more energy than its decay products, and this seems to violate the conservation of energy. So in 1930, Wolfgang Pauli made a pretty wild suggestion. He said that what if all that missing energy is actually going into a new sort of particle, one that's passing right through our detectors without us knowing? In 1934, Enrico Fermi took this prediction and made it even more precise, including things that physicists had learned about atomic nuclei in the meantime. But still, at the time, 
Not many people took this idea too seriously. His paper even got rejected from the prominent journal Nature for being too out there. I mean, a new kind of invisible particle, it's kind of a bold way to solve your little decay problem. And not only that, but it's not just one kind of neutrino that they're suggesting. It turns out that there are three kinds of neutrinos, sometimes called different flavors. We call these three types the electron neutrino, the muon neutrino, and the tau neutrino. This is a big prediction, so of course, physicists went out and started searching for them. And when they did, they found another big surprise. So back in the 1960s, a group of physicists led by Ray Davis and John Bacall built a detector to detect the neutrinos that were coming from the sun. So the sun gets its power through nuclear fusion, and every time it fuses together four protons to make a helium nucleus, two neutrinos are created kind of as a byproduct. So there's tons and tons of neutrinos coming out of the sun in all directions. So to try to detect these neutrinos for the first time, they built a roughly swimming pool sized detector deep beneath their surface in South Dakota's home state gold mine. So the home state experiment was a big success. And in 1968, they reported that they had detected these solar neutrinos for the first time. The weird or unexpected thing was that the rate of these neutrinos that they had measured was lower than the predicted value by about a factor of three. They didn't know what the solution was, but they tried to hunt down different possibilities. So they went back to their theoretical calculations and refined those, and they improved certain components in the experiment and took data for a lot longer. And as these things, you know, tightened their un uncertainties, they, they just found more and more that they kept getting the same number. The observed rate was about three times too low, and they didn't know what the solution was. It turns out that the resolution to this so-called solar neutrino problem had to do with the kinds of or flavors of neutrinos that exist. The processes that take place in the sun only produce neutrinos of one flavor, electron neutrinos. And the kind of detector they'd built at Homestake was only sensitive to this one kind of neutrino. What McCall and Davis and others didn't know at the time is that those neutrinos were transforming their flavor as they traveled between the sun and the earth. So by the time they reached the earth, they weren't just electron neutrinos, but they were a mixture of electron, muon, and tau neutrinos, causing two thirds of the neutrinos to go undetected, explaining why they were observing a rate that was three times lower than was expected. So by the late 80s or early 90s, several different experiments had confirmed the homestake result, but no one really knew what was going on. And none of these experiments really helped to clarify anything. Until 1998, when this experiment called Super Kamiokande, or just Super K for short, added a lot of new information to this puzzle. So let me describe Super K. It's an incredible experiment. It's a huge tank of ultra pure water deep underground in Japan. Its water tank is about 50,000 tons. And around this tank of ultra pure water, there are 13,000 detectors that can detect even tiny amounts of, of light down to like individual photons. So they built Super K not to detect neutrinos primarily, but to look for proton decay, which they still have never observed. But as a side effect, they were really sensitive to neutrinos from the sun and from other sources. And when they counted up all their data, it turns out that Super K saw not a third of the predicted number of neutrinos, but about a half. And what was really going on is that they were seeing the same third that they were seeing at Homestake, but they could also detect some of the muon and tau neutrinos that Homestake had missed. Not all of them, but some of them. So when you take all this into account, they got a higher rate. And then the plot kind of thickened about a year later when the Super K scientists announced that they had also observed this sort of phenomena going on among the neutrinos that were pro being produced in the Earth's atmosphere. So when they looked at the energy distribution and the directions of all those neutrinos, they could tell that neutrinos were oscillating from between flavors in the Earth's atmosphere. A couple of years after this, physicists at the Solar Neutrino Observatory in uh, Canada's Sudbury Mine announced that they had done a measurement of all three flavors of neutrinos from the sun, 
And this matched perfectly with the theoretical expectations. It wasn't a half or a third of what was expected, but almost exactly what was expected. It was the first time that you could detect all three flavors at once. And for the first time, it just matched the theoretical predictions perfectly. So that gave us confidence that this weird behavior is really happening. Electron neutrinos emitted by the sun were transforming into different flavors during their journey towards Earth. We now call this behavior neutrino oscillation. So it's as if you leave your coffee cup and the next time you look at it, you have no idea whether it's going to be coffee, whether it's going to be green tea, whether it's going to be soda <laughs> until you take a look at it. And it's even weirder the thing on your desk might not even be coffee or tea or milk, but a superposition, a, a quantum combination of all those things. So now's when we get into the juicy quantum details behind this thing. So we all know that quantum mechanics is weird and neutrino oscillations are a great example of this, but to try to come up with a way of explaining the way that quantum mechanics and neutrino oscillations are connected, I, I've come up with this weird analogy. So bear with me here. So say I have two different objects and I can tell you that one of the objects is red and the other one is blue. And I also tell you that one of the objects is a cube and the other one is a ball. So in your ordinary experience, this leaves two different possibilities. Maybe you have a red ball and a blue cube or you have a red cube and a blue ball. Those are the only two possibilities that our day-to-day -day experience lead us to expect. Furthermore, in our day-to-day -day experience, we don't expect the characteristics of these objects to spontaneously change. If I have a red object, I expect it to stay red. If I have a cube, I expect it to stay a cube, just like my coffee cup. These are properties that we expect to persist over time, but that's not what happens in quantum physics. So in the situation I've just described, if you know the color of one of the objects, you can also deduce what its shape is, the red ball or the blue cube. But in quantum mechanics, two sets of properties like this don't necessarily have to map onto the two objects in the same way that our intuition leads us to expect. For example, we could have a situation in which the object that is shaped like a ball is in a superposition or a quantum combination of both red and blue states. So in practice, this means that if you make a measurement of an object shape and find out that it's, for example, a ball, you still don't know whether it's red or blue. In fact, it's not only red or blue. Instead, it's in a combination of red and blue states at the same time. In quantum physics, this sort of stuff happens all the time. A quantum particle or a quantum object could be in a bunch of different places at once. It could have a bunch of different values of its energy all at the same time. And similarly, in this case, a red object could be both cube and ball at the same time, or a ball could be both red and blue at the same time. All right, so the same kind of thing that's going on with these cubes and spheres that are red and blue is also going on with the particles we call neutrinos. But instead of their shape and color, we're talking about the mass of their particles and what we call their flavor. So the three flavors are what we mentioned before, the three different types of neutrinos. And in principle, each flavor would have a different but very, very small mass. But now think about our analogy of a ball that's both red and blue at the same time. In the case of the neutrinos, a neutrino with a particular value of its mass isn't necessarily one particular flavor. It could be a combination or a superposition of all three flavors. So whenever you have a neutrino with a well-defined mass, it turns out that it's in a combination of all three types or all three flavors. And whenever you have a neutrino that has a well-defined flavor, it's in a superposition of all three masses. What this means is that as the neutrino is traveling between the sun and our detector, it's not just switching between the three different types. It's actually becoming a superposition of all three types at once. And it's just at the moment of hitting the detector where it settles on one. Okay, so neutrinos are intrinsically in these superpositions with these different characteristics, but it still doesn't explain why they oscillate or transform from one kind of neutrino into another kind of neutrino. 
The reason for this all comes down to the main equation that we teach in our classes on quantum mechanics. This is called the Schrodinger equation. Well, this equation allows us to figure out how any number of, of quantum objects will behave, but in particular, it tells us how they'll evolve from one state into another. And it turns out that the rates for these sorts of transformations depend on how much difference there is between the energies of the two states. So in this case, we're talking about energy in the form of the neutrinos masses. So if all three of the neutrinos had exactly the same mass, they wouldn't transform. But if they have masses and those masses are different from one another, the Schrodinger equation says that one state will gradually transform into another and then eventually back and forth. This is what drives neutrino oscillations to happen, at least if the neutrinos have masses that are different from each other. So here we come to big neutrino surprise number uh, two, three, I can't keep track. Anyway, we've kind of been taking for granted so far that neutrinos would have a mass. But according to our standard model of particle physics, they really shouldn't. The way that the other particles in the standard model come to have masses is through their interactions with the Higgs field. This is something we call the Higgs mechanism. But it turns out that the way that works is the Higgs field has to interact with a particle spinning both clockwise and counterclockwise to give it a mass. This is how things like the electron or the quarks get a mass. But it turns out that all of the neutrinos are spinning counterclockwise. There aren't any spinning clockwise. So it can't get a mass this way. So if you just took the standard model at face value, you really should expect the neutrinos to be exactly massless. But we've observed this neutrino oscillation already, which means that they have to have mass. It's an incredibly small mass, millions of times lighter than the next lightest particle, the electron. But still, how it's possible that neutrinos have a mass is still a huge mystery. We have theories, or guesses at least, for how neutrinos might have come to have this small amount of mass. Um, and these theories generally go by the name of the seesaw mechanism. You have the kind of neutrinos we observe and this other kind that we call sterile neutrinos, and they interact with each other in a way where the active neutrinos, the one we observe, get driven to really small values of their mass, while the others get driven to really high values of their mass, like uh, one person on either end of a seesaw. So th these theories are perfectly good. They're pretty simple and they do the job. But those very, very heavy particles that are predicted are so heavy that they're really hard to test in any kind of experiment we can come up with. So, you know, probably this is going to remain an open question for a while, exactly how this works. I hope that that's not true and I hope we figure it out, but it's, it's going to be a hard nut, nut to crack. So this weird fact of nature that neutrinos have some mass doesn't only have implications for neutrino oscillations. Despite being the lightest particles in the universe, neutrinos might actually have a noticeable effect on cosmology or how the universe evolves on large timescales. If they had been massless, the neutrinos that were created in the Big Bang would still be traveling throughout the universe at the speed of light. But because they have their small masses, they gradually slow down. And that means billions and billions of years ago, these particles started to act like matter. And that has an impact on how gravity formed things like galaxies and clusters of galaxies and other large-scale structure. By measuring this large-scale structure, we can learn about how all this happened, but also learn about the neutrinos themselves. In fact, from observations of the galaxy distribution and things like this, we've been able to put an upper limit on the sum of all three neutrino masses of about 0.12 electron volts. So, you know, just, you know, a few million times smaller than the mass of the electron. Right. So that's like, you're not even measuring the neutrino directly. You're getting an estimate for its mass just by looking at the galaxy structures. That's exactly right. Yeah. And if you asked this question 10 years ago, you wouldn't be able to get anything close to this. So like, it was really ramped up as our, our detailed understanding of this stuff from, you know, the dark energy survey and, and uh, Lyman Alpha Forest and all, all these sorts of measurements have, have become better in recent years. So cosmology gives us an upper limit on the sum of the masses of these three neutrino types. Basically, we know the heaviest they could possibly be. And we have some idea of the lightest they could possibly be, too. 
So from the rates that we observe these particles, these neutrinos to oscillate, we can also put a lower limit on the sum of their three masses, and that's about 0 0.06 electron volts. So there's only like a factor of two that we, you know, have to play with yet. So that makes me pretty confident that in the, you know, pretty near future, cosmologists will be able to not only put limits on the neutrino masses, but really measure them for the first time, con concretely figuring out how heavy these particles are. Thanks for listening to Why This Universe. As a reminder, our Patreon is now up on patreon.com slash why this universe. If you want to support us more and get access to some exclusive content and a free sticker, thank you so much for your support. Our show is produced and edited by me, Shalma Wegsman, co-hosted by Professor Dan Hooper of the University of Chicago and Fermilab, and all music is produced by Jake Kleinbaum. Why This Universe is brought to you by the University of Chicago Podcast Network. Music